Uh, hi, I'm Director of Data Science at Cloudera. My name is Sean. Um, one thing I am not is actually a um, bioinformatician, bioinform genomicist. I'm not one of those things, so it's strange that I'm giving this talk, uh, but I'll, I'll explain a little bit about why in a second here. Um, first, uh, what is genomics? Um, that's a good question. I didn't really know until last week. Uh, people on our team work in genomics at, at Cloudera. We try to know a little bit about a bunch of different fields to help our customers build and data science and do machine learning on, on, on uh, data in Hadoop. And I'm actually giving one of my colleagues' presentations. So I asked him to explain it to me, and he, and he did in about an hour. Uh, does anyone here know the difference between a chromosome and a, and a genome? OK, then we're actually roughly in the same uh, bucket here, I think. Don't worry, I can still uh, make some interesting observations for you, I think, here. Um, well, put it this way, if we look inside of any of us and we, we, we look very carefully, you'll see cells. And if you look inside cells, you will see uh, chromosomes. Uh, are you following me so far? I think we remember this from, from school. And we have 23 pairs of them. And uh, the chromosomes define our genome or our genes. So if chromosomes are like the um, ink on a page, then our genome are the, the words that they express. And of course, as we all know, uh, this, this is encapsulates our genetic code and defines who we are and, and why we're different. Really amazing stuff. If you know that much, I think you've you're, you're, you got half of what you need here to, to follow the presentation. The interesting thing about chromosomes is they're, they're quite simple. If you look very, very closely at them, they're, they're linear. And they're written in this language with just four characters, A, G, C, and T, uh, for four different uh, uh, base pairs. Uh, so we can actually, you can stretch out a chromosome and think of it as one big string, which is interesting. Uh, that makes it in, in interestingly computable. The maybe more amazing thing about our chromosomes in our genome is how similar they are. So if we went around the room and looked at all your, your chromosomes and laid them out together, we'd find they were very similar, 99.9, .9, maybe even 9% the same which is astounding. Uh, so that means they're so similar that we can even start to talk about correspondences between your chromosomes and mine, and your genome and, and mine. In fact, we're so similar that you could almost define a, a reference chromosome, a, a centroid, if you like, of all of our, 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 our genomes as a sort of um, a midpoint of all humans on the planet. And we could start to talk meaningfully about known locations within our genomes just because we are, in fact, so similar. And that's actually an astounding idea that we're so similar that we could all define ourselves as, as just small diffs off of this uh, median human or this reference genome. And that's one of the ideas underlying a lot of work in modern genomics. So this was why the Human Genome Project was a big deal. This uh, finished in, I think, 2000. There's uh, Craig Ventner on the left. This cost billions of dollars. And uh, we were able to get out a rough draft of this reference human genome out of this project for the first time. Uh, it's not, not a genome that corresponds to a perfect person or any existing person, but it was like the most convenient centroid from which to, to diff all of us. And that was an amazing step forward. So the act of um, plotting our, 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 our genome is a lot like map making in a way. Um, what we have are raw materials that I, I would call something like satellite pictures would be. So a satellite uh, photo like this, um, yes, it's of a, a place in the world. It's probably not clear what this is unless you're really good at reading satellite images or really familiar with New York City. This is actually Washington State Park, uh, so, sorry, yeah, in, in the middle of um, uh, downtown New York. Um, but by cross-referencing this with some other information we have, we might start to uh, label this map and decide that this is a certain building, this is a certain street, and to make sense of this raw satellite information we have. And by piecing these things together, we might start to make better and better maps that are meaningful because they're, they're tagged. And we can, we can relate to them uh, places we need to go, things we need to do. We can relate those to this map. And eventually, it's just those annotations that become the really useful thing. It's not the actual literal um, um, uh, pictures of the Earth that matter, but the logical view of the Earth that matters. And so that's why we probably more often use this view of Google Maps than the satellite imagery. So I think this is analogous to what we do with, with, with our, our chromosomes. We, this is like a very, very zoomed out satellite view of you and your DNA. This is, uh, and what we try to do in um, genomics is translate this somehow, or map this somehow, and, 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 uh, and put some semantics on top of the chromosomes. So this is, if you like, the equivalent of the Google 
maps view of the world without satellite imagery. This is, this is a, a, a system you can use to browse the human genome. It's very complicated, a lot going on here, but really for one chromosome, we've zoomed into one region and can see some regions of the genome that have been tagged with certain properties. This causes this, uh, a certain disease to be expressed and so on and so on. So if you like, it's that bit in the middle that's the, the um, street and building name overview on top of the genome. And that's what's really interesting and useful. And that's what I think uh, genomics is, is trying to, to build for us. Now, one of the reasons people are so excited about genomics and why so much has gone on in the past, say, uh, 10 or 15 years, is because it's gotten so much cheaper to sequence the human genome. Um, you can see in the past 15, uh, 14 or 15 years here, the price of sequencing a single human genome has dropped drastically. And if it's not clear, this is a logarithmic scale. So it's gone from $100 million down to just over $1,000, which is incredible. So that's opened up so much more possibility because we can get so many more genomes to, to look at and, and to cross-reference. And part of the reason this has uh, become so much cheaper is computing power. So in a nutshell, we found ways to do simple and relatively cheap physical processes to our, our, our DNA and pair that with a bunch of computing power to ultimately sequence the genome. So we've avoided a lot of the expensive manual processes that caused sequencing a genome to be incredibly expensive before by swapping them in for very cheap processes that paired with a lot of computing power still get us the answer we need. And this is really what bioinformatics as a field is all about today. Um, quite literally, it's a, a, the, the act of uh, reconstructing a map from a bunch of, of shreds. Literally, we get pieces of, a, of, of DNA out of a process, and we use a lot of computing power to reassemble them into a fully sequenced genome. And, and that's, actually, uh, that's actually the interesting part here, and that's where a lot of the computing power comes in. Now, if you looked into how this is accomplished, I won't explain how this is accomplished. I, I'm not even an expert in this space, but not surprisingly, it's a pipeline of software and data. There's a lot of steps. We take the raw um, strings of uh, base pairs that we get out of these processes, and we, we, we align them to the genome, and we deduplicate, and we um, filter, and we transform, and so on. This is like any other ETL process you might be familiar with in, in your work. Suffice to say, people have written software to do all of these steps and it works, and it's, it's fine for what it is, but it may not be enough going forward. And the reason is that a lot of these pieces of software have been written by, well, researchers and working independently in different platforms. And not surprisingly, they've made maybe different formats for the same thing. They've implemented some uh, common tools in native code or in Java, or in uh, SQL or some uh, exotic languages. So the, the whole pipeline, such as it is, is a little bit of a ragtag assembly of, of quality working, but, but ultimately heterogeneous software. And this ends up being a barrier. For example, if you just look at the number of different file formats there are to express this, what should be a simple string based out of four characters, there are at least nine different formats, none of which is used universally, uh, and there's no tool that supports all nine of them. So at some level, this, this degree of um, uh, lack of coordination is maybe holding back some of the research today. If you look at some of the file formats and you are a, a data engineer, which is kind of what I think of myself as, even though I'm called a data scientist, you might start to appreciate some of the problems. The, the formats are not necessarily big data friendly. They're compressed at times, which is actually unfriendly to systems like Hadoop. Uh, they are semi-structured. Here you can see records, but also headers with, with um, uh, fields with uh, other formats within fields. Um, it has some global properties that are hard to maintain, like this format needs a, a global sort order on the, 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 the elements it expresses, even though that's not necessarily needed for a lot of steps in, in, the, in the process. So this is also a bit of a problem. Um, in fact, if you also look at some of the, the code that's been put together for, for these processes. This is a bit of Java code that accomplishes deduplication in one, in one common tool for, for this stage of the pipeline. If you dig in, uh, you'll see it has options like max file handles to open to, to do reading. This is a very operating system level setting. It's not really clear why a, a, a researcher should have to know and tune and set these things only in this tool. So there's a, lot of a, there's a homegrown nature to a lot of these tools, which are, are wonderful, and they've, they've gotten the job done, but maybe not optimal. 
After all, if you're sitting in the room and you are familiar with big data technologies like Hadoop, like we are at Cloudera, um, these seem like problems that have been solved before. These are things we're not we're accustomed to, to leaving to frameworks and to the platform to decide and optimize for us. So uh, when, we, when we talk about um, these pipelines, it's easy to begin to imagine them as pipelines we could re-implement on top of modern big data technologies like, like Hadoop and its ecosystem. After all, we don't just want to sequence one genome, we want to sequence a lot of them. So how are we going to scale up this pipeline if it's not written in a, in a distributed way? Well, the good news is we can trivially scale up uh, these pipelines just by cloning them. Uh, we can, this is a pipeline to sequence one human genome, and if we wanted to do 1,000 of them, we could run 1,000 uh, of these pipelines on 1,000 different machines and scale it up that way, which is pretty good. Now, that's not bad, but um, is that going to be sufficient? For example, uh, we work with Genomics England, whose goal is to sequence 100,000 human genomes. Yes, maybe we can manually um, run thousands and thousands of machines and, and manually babysit this pipeline over and over to sequence 100,000 genomes, but is that realistic? Is that optimal? Is it even efficient? After all, it's not just a question of performance. Um, it's not necessarily a good idea to run all of these jobs in parallel. For example, the, the later phases could benefit by cross-referencing the results of several genomes pipelines, not just operating independently. Uh, likewise, I'm told the recalibration phase would actually be more effective if it could share information across these runs rather than work only in isolation. So this is beginning to look like a more complicated graph of operations. And this is something that, again, in the, in the, in the big data ecosystem, we're completely accustomed to implementing in a distributed way with frameworks like Spark or, or Flink, for example. So why can't we apply these technologies to this problem in genomics? Well, well we are. Um, for example, within the Hadoop ecosystem, people have long since solved the problem of file formats. Uh, file formats that are friendly to big data technologies, that are, compress well in, in the proper way, that are, can represent uh, complex structured types. Uh, this is what you get with projects like Avro and Parquet. And in fact, it's no big deal to re-express re the, uh, the types of information these nine different formats are trying to encode in a simple or Parquet or Avro format. We can actually get better compression and we can make it more available to big data technologies. Likewise, it's not that hard to re-implement a lot of these, uh, these operations, the, the filtering and the transforming and the recalibration in the context of big data frameworks like, like, like Spark here, for example, uh, which is perfectly happy to uh, distribute work and collect and share data across pipelines in a, in a complex way and do it all efficiently. So this is something we should be able to re-implement on top of the standard Hadoop stack. Why continue to uh, run this on expensive HPC clusters with expensive and uh, differing frameworks and different sorts of implementations when we can run it on commodity hardware with open source uh, storage frameworks like HDFS, open source formats, open source resource managers, open source execution frameworks that are widely used beyond bioinformatics. So not surprisingly, that's already underway. So, uh, and this exists in the, uh, the so-called Atom project. So Atom is um, a re-implementation of a lot of this pipeline on top of, of Spark, which is um, an execution framework in the Hadoop ecosystem. So this is an example of some of these very same pipeline operations I've described implemented in Atom, which is really just some Scala and, and Spark code. And boy, it does look a lot more tidy. It is possible to make this a nice, tidy uh, flow uh, given modern big data technologies. It's a real project driven out of uh, AMP Lab, which is the same organization that gave us Spark, not surprisingly. It's open source. It's out there already. It's built on top of, uh, of these uh, uh, Hadoop and, and related open source technologies. And it's something uh, folks on our team actually do contribute to, like the, like the author of this presentation. So the good news is we are getting there. We are now able to apply some of these big data technologies to the problem of genomics. In fact, it's letting us do things that were maybe hard or impossible to do with these ad hoc pipelines before. Um, like I'm told, for example, there's a, a complicated and valuable operation called a spatial join that we need to do during this phase. Difficult to do without a distributed framework, quite simple to do with a distributed framework. So uh, I'm told that not only are we able to accomplish more and run these things faster, we can get better results out of these pipelines by properly distributing them. Um, here's a just a quick taste of a benchmark 
I think the, the, the lesson here is not so much that the Atom implementation runs faster or uses fewer resources than the existing implementation, but that it scales out better. So we can actually throw more machines at it and get it to run faster and faster in, in a pretty linear way. And along the way, maybe even get out some better results in, in some cases. So good news. We can, this says we can make the genomics pipeline scale up efficiently. That's pretty good because we're not going to stop at 100,000 genomes. Uh, Craig Venter is out here tweeting already. He wants to sequence a million human genomes. And I guess there's, what, a couple billion people on the planet? So wh why stop there? We do need to build towards that goal. And it's time to re-implement and, and really marry genomics and big data. And it's, it's possible with modern big data technologies. And I think, I think it's quite exciting. This, uh, this made me want to get into the field myself. A uh, big thank you in, in closing here to the actual folks on our team, like Uri, who put the, to together this presentation, who do know what they're talking about. I apologize, I'm just a messenger. And some of the other folks uh, uh, that actually put together the content behind this. It's an exciting field and it's an exciting application of, of big data technologies like Hadoop. So thank you very much. <laughs>